Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome to part one of my lecture on chapter seven, species interactions, ecological succession, and population control. Once again, we have 46 slides or so to go through, so I will break this lecture into two parts with part one beginning right now. So as always, we'll start off with a core case study. We're gonna talk about the southern sea otter, a species in recovery. So these, giant, uh, these southern sea otters live in giant kelp forests off the Pacific coast. They were almost hunted to extinction in the early 1900s, but they've seen a partial recovery since they've been listed as an endangered species in 1977. Why do we care about sea otters? Well, they are a keystone species um, in the coastal uh, waters of the Pacific uh, of the Pacific coast. Uh, there's an ethical issue there about uh, caring about other other earth creatures, and of course, tourism dollars as well. So, what are the factors in declining sea otter population? Well, there's been increased Increased predation by orcas, which are a type of whale. Uh, toxic algae and pollution uh, pollutants released into the ocean have disrupted the ecosystems where the uh, sea otters live. They have a low reproductive rate. They don't reproduce very rapidly. Uh, so that also can help in uh, declining or becoming endangered. And they have a rising uh, mortality rate because of the uh, pollutants uh, that are being put into their ecosystem. Other threats, oil spills and fishing traps. But again, the otter population has been rising in the past uh, last several years because they've been put on the endangered species list. So kind of a little bit of a victory for us. I told you a lot of the uh, stuff we talk about in this class is negative, but this is a positive. We knew the southern sea otters were becoming extinct. We put them on the endangered species list, and now we are seeing a partial recovery of their population, which is good because there you have the little guy on the left. Uh, there is a uh, endangered southern sea otter in Monterey Bay, California. These creatures actually use technology, believe it or not. He is actually, or she, I'm not sure if it's a he or a she, uh, is using stones to break open clamshells. That's what you're seeing right here. And again, that is technology, a use of tools to help uh, achieve something. On the right, those are the giant kelp forests uh, that the southern sea otters live in. So what are the threats to the kelp forest? Well, these giant kelp uh, are anchored to the ocean floor. They grow towards the surface. They're very fast growing. They're resistant to storm and wave damage, and they support many marine plants and animals like the southern sea otter. Sea urchins prey on the kelp plant. So the southern sea otter actually helps control that sea urchin population. And again, all of this, the entire ecosystem threatened by pollutants and climate change. Okay, so that's kind of a little introduction to talk about the interaction between species and the environment. Now we're going to actually dive into the five ways that species interact with one another for resource use and population size. Competition. Predation, paratism, mutualism, and commensalism. These are the five ways that species interact, and we're going to talk about those five in detail in part one here now of this lecture. So first, we're going to start with competition. Competition for resources is the most common interaction between species. Interspecific competition is when you have competition between different species to use the same limited resource. However, because of this competition, there, uh, creatures have actually evolved ways to help alleviate some of the competition. So the first way is known as resource partitioning. This occurs when different species evolve specialized traits that allow them to share the same resources. So species may use only part of the resource. Maybe they use it at a different time or they use it in a different way. So couple of examples of resource partitioning. The first one talks about these warblers, which are insect-eating birds in Maine. This is uh, basically a spruce forest, or supposed to be in, in, in uh, northern Maine. And what we're showing here is resource partitioning. So what does that mean? Well, all five of these birds eat insects. So if they ate insects in the same spot on the tree, they would be in constant competition with one another to get those insects. So what has happened? Natural selection has evolved these warblers so that each type of warbler actually feeds in a different part of the tree, right? So the black Burnian warbler feeds on the outside and towards the top of the tree, while the black-throated green warbler 
uh, feeds towards the middle uh, of the tree, right? The Cape May warbler only feeds on the top. The bay-breasted warbler feeds in the middle, but a little lower down than the black-throated. And the yellow-rumped warbler feeds only at the bottom of the tree. So by partitioning the resources, these warblers have evolved so that they're not in direct competition for the same insects because one is foraging at the top of the tree, another in the middle, another at the bottom, another along the edges, et cetera, et cetera. Another example of resource partitioning is with these finches, okay? Uh, we had an unknown finch ancestor that then began to evolve. And what happened was all these finches were basically going for the same resources. They were going for fruit and seed and insects and nectar. And what has happened is over time, natural selection has allowed these finches to evolve so that their beaks can only eat certain substances. So on the left here, you have the finches that are the fruit and seed eaters. And you'll notice their beaks are in most cases a little uh, thicker and, and smaller, right, to maybe crack open a seed or to eat fruit. While on the right side, these finches evolve to eat insects and nectar. And you'll notice their beaks are thinner and a little longer to maybe get into that flower to suck out the nectar or to shove that beak in a tree to maybe get those insects out. So over time, because these creatures were, uh, these finches were all fighting one another for the same resources, natural selection has evolved them or caused them to evolve in this resource partitioning that allows them to not be in direct competition for resources. So again, these interactions causes natural selection and evolution that then causes speciation and different species. So it's kind of all, 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 all interconnected uh, in the end. All right, so that's competition. Again, the number one way that uh, species interact with one another. The second one we're going to talk about is predation. Predation is your predator and prey, right? A predator feeds directly on all or part of a member of another species, which we call the prey. This has a strong effect on population sizes and other factors in ecosystems. There are many methods of predation. Walk, swim, or fly. You can camouflage or you can call or we call something called chemical warfare. Prey species has, have also evolved ways to avoid predators via camouflage or chemical warfare or warning coloration or mimicry or behavioral strategies. So again, it's this co-evolution that happens between the predator and the prey. The predator evolves a way to uh, more easily get the prey. The prey then evolves to not as easily get eaten by the predator. Then the predator evolves to eat the prey more easily and the prey evolves to not get eaten as easily by the predator. And as a result, you have natural selection and you end up having evolution. So uh, here is uh, an example of the predator-prey relationship. Of course, this is a uh, brown bear eating a salmon uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And what we're seeing here are, again, these are evolution way, evolutionary ways to either be a predator or to not become prey, right? So for instance, A and B are examples of camouflage, right? The span worm and the wandering leaf insect kind of camouflage or blend into the background and therefore the predator can't find it. You'll notice C, D, and E is chemical warfare, right? These beetles, um, um, this beetle has a chemical that it will spray on its prey. The monarch butterfly has a chemical that makes it foul tasting so that predators don't really want to eat it, right? The poison dart frog is poisonous. So if you try to eat it, you will die, right? So that's a way that the prey stays away from the predator, okay? Uh, mimicry, number F, right? This visceral butterfly looks like the monarch. It doesn't taste bad, but it looks like a creature that tastes bad, and so it allows predators to stay away from it. Uh, G is more deceptive looks, right? This moth looks like it has two big eyes uh, that come from a large animal. That could scare off a predator. Uh, deceptive behavior. When touched, the snake caliper, uh, caterpillar changes shape to look like the head of a snake, again, to try to get predators to not eat it. So as you get this relationship, right, though, evolution continues. So what happens is the prey might get a, might evolve a way uh, that 
It doesn't care that this caterpillar uh, looks like the head of a snake. It's going to eat it anyways. And then this caterpillar will evolve in a way to uh, help another way to maybe protect it from the prey. And that's how the predator-prey relationships work in an ecosystem. And again, that's how you get evolution and new species. Here we go. Coevolution, right? That's what we're talking about here. So predation plays a role in natural selection. Animals with better defenses against predation or predators tend to leave more offspring, right? So coevolution, what is it? It's changes in the gene pool of one species can cause changes in the gene pool of another. Example, bats and moths, the echo echocalation of bats and the sensitive hearing of moths, right, have been co-evolved because bats feed on moths. So the bats uh, use the uh, echolation to figure out where the moths are. Then the moths evolve to have this very sensitive hearing to hear where the bats are. So again, they evolve predator prey evolving together coevolution uh again to for one side to eat more prey and for the other side to not get eaten as much and again those traits evolve together uh in that predator prey relationship and again we call that coevolution all right the final three Paratitism, mutualism, and commensalism um, are not as detailed as the other two, so we're going to kind of cover those rather quickly. Uh, so paratitism is when one species, a parasite, lives on another organism. However, parasites harm but rarely kill their host, right? Think about it. Natural selection, evolution. If parasites killed their hosts, that would be no good for the parasite, right? The parasite needs the host to live. So these parasites, they harm the host, but they rarely kill them. Examples of parasites, tapeworms, sea lampreys, fleas, ticks, okay? Things that we, uh, that we know about. Again, you get a tick on you, uh, you, may get, you may get Lyme disease, right? But that rarely kills you, okay? It harms you, uh, but it rarely kills you. What we're looking at here is a blood-sucking sea lamprey. That's this creature right here, uh, sucking the blood of an adult lake trout in uh, Lake uh, Michigan. Um, again, the lamprey is harming the trout by sucking its blood, but it doesn't kill the trout. Again, this is uh, a form of, of parasitism. Mutualism is when you have interaction between species that benefits both species, kind of mutual benefit. That's how I kind of think of it. Uh, nutrition and a protective relationship, potentially. It's not cooperation. So these creatures are not cooperating like, let's say, human beings would cooperate with uh, one another. It's mutual exploitation. But again, the interaction or the exploitation benefits both species. So an example would be clownfish that live within sea anemones, right? These clownfish gain protection and feed on on waste matter left by the anemone's meals. In return, the clownfish protect the sea anemones from some predators and parasites. So again, they're not necessarily cooperating, but both of them interact and both of them get a benefit from that interaction, and that is called mutualism. Um, what are we looking at here? Another example. These are known as oxpeckers, or these birds uh, that are feeding on parasites and ticks that infest animals like this impala. So again, they feed on the animal, or the ticks, or the uh, other insects that may, or parasites that may be on the impala. Um, so they're eating. And what does the impala get? The impala gets cleaned of the ticks and the parasites that are on them, right? So they're not necessarily cooperating, but they're living, interacting in this mutualism way that both of them get a benefit from the interaction. Again, that is mutualism. The final uh, type of interaction is called commensalism. Commensalism benefits one species and has little effect on the other species. So an example would be an epithyte, which is an air plant that attaches uh, themselves to trees, right? So this plant attaches itself to a tree in the air, um, doesn't affect the tree at all, and obviously it benefits itself because now it is above the ground on this tree uh, away from potential predators or something that may eat that plant. Birds nest in a tree, right? So a bird's nest in a tree, that is commensalism. The birds are using the tree right? One species, another species. It has no effect on the tree, right? But it definitely benefits the birds to have their nests in a tree, again, high up away from predators that might want to prey on um, eggs or young, 
young chicks, something like that. Okay, that is commensalism. And here is an example of that. This is a pitcher plant uh, that has attached uh, to a, a plant without harming it. Uh, the pitcher plant feeds on insects that go in down into that pitcher. Um, so again, this is an example of commensalism, the plant not harming the tree. The tree gets nothing from this plant, but being on this tree helps and benefits the pitcher plant because it allows the insects to get in there a little bit easier than, let's say, if that pitcher plant was on the ground. All right. So that's going to conclude part one of my lecture. We talked about species interaction. Part two of my lecture on chapter seven will discuss ecological succession and population control. So make sure to uh, watch that. And as always, I thank you for listening.